early gold rush California quintessentially represented American democracy. Emigrants were quick to recreate the forms of local government which existed in the eastern half of the United States. The vast majority of those who traveled overland to California joined a company, groups of usually about 40 men living in close proximity, where they pooled their resources and agreed to share earnings. Voluntary organizations were governed by articles of association or a constitution, requiring election of officers and decisions by majority vote. Mining camps operated as frontier governments. Crimes incited vociferous indignation, and those caught were tried by jury. Typical punishments for those who were found guilty were flogging and expulsion. The most important function of camp governance was to ensure equal opportunity to every miner. Anyone could claim mining lands as long as they worked them. Settlers protected each other's rights and claims, but only for fellow whites. White immigrants formed militias to terrorize Chinese, Native American, and Mexican immigrants. Volunteerist militias historically have been central to American democracy. The Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights states that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. The colonies established militias to fight Native Americans, and in wars against indigenous peoples, settlers of different ethnicities developed a shared racial consciousness. Manifest Destiny, the idea that the expansion of the American nation from coast to coast was divinely ordained, assumed the genocide of Native Americans. Americans learned from history books, novels, and their parents that they were heirs to a pioneering tradition which was purportedly bringing civilization to the wilderness. As one Eastern newspaper put it, the California Native American would soon enough disappear in the inevitable course of that destiny which has opened the long hidden treasures of the Pacific coast to the energies of civilization. The Arkansas Gazette asked why pioneers of the day should shrink from the journey when their forefathers had defeated savages more numerous and warlike by far than the California Indians. In his 1851 address to the state legislature, Governor Peter Burnett declared that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct. Not everyone wanted to exterminate Native Americans. After all, miners were too obsessed with striking at rich to grow their own food. To help large landowners replace the workers who had fled to the mines, the legislator passed a bill called an Act for the Government and Protection of Indians. While this act technically outlawed native enslavement, legislators structured the law to effectively deprive natives of the ability to protect themselves from marauding whites. The law allowed any white person to accuse a native of drunkenness, idleness, or vagrancy, while disallowing natives from testifying against their white accusers. So accusations always became convictions. The punishment was a fine, but if a native couldn't pay the fine, the court would auction him off to any white person willing to pay it. When natives denied the capacity to contravene whites in court, the slave trade flourished, with raiders invading native rancherias, raping the women, killing anyone who resisted, and corralling the rest to be brought before the courts. Under this act, whites enslaved as many as 20,000 natives, many of them children. These children served the purposes of both labor and lust. A boy who could perform drudgery or drive hogs might cost $80. White bachelors especially prized handsome, clean girls up to 12 years of age and in prime condition. These virgin girls went for as much as $200 at auction. Technically, the presence of a parent or friend was required at court before a judge could bond a child. But judges permitted kidnappers to stand as friends of the family, because laws are only as sound as the people enforcing them. As the agricultural economy boomed towards the end of the 1850s, ranchers and farmers sought to fill labor shortages by expanding the 1850 law. The 1860 amendment to the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians extended the period for youth indenture from 18 to 25, and it instructed magistrates to seek out and bind children of Native families, quote, not having the means for suitable maintenance. Since most Native families suffered some degree of impoverishment, justices of the peace could practically confiscate any Native child. As is so often the case with American political economy, racism created poverty, Racists blamed culture for that poverty and then invented new forms of state-sanctioned exploitation purportedly for the benefit of the indigent. White settlers also exploited racist stereotypes of native carnality and savagery to seize children. In one instance, a man claimed that a child's mother lived in adulterous intercourse with different classes of persons, making her incompetent to maintain, educate, and care for her son. The judge agreed and granted the man custody of the child. As for the adults, to avoid idleness, California natives competed for scarce jobs that paid as little as 50 cents a day, about one-sixth the typical minor income. Some employers paid only with alcohol, and when California natives got drunk, they would be arrested and sold back as slaves. Wage work meant natives couldn't gather winter supplies, so starvation ensued. When they stole cattle and horses to stave off starvation, whites formed volunteer companies and indiscriminately slaughtered natives. Newspapers incited violence by falsely attributing nearly every instance of murder and missing livestock to Native Americans. 
It didn't even take missing livestock or murders to provoke massacres. When a tribe near the Eel River in 1852 accused a man of cognizance about the murder of a native teenager, he freaked out, returned with a volunteer company, surrounded the village of the tribe, shot every man and a number of women, and burnt their houses. The company then did the same thing two miles up the river. Altogether, they killed 30 to 40 natives. When Reddick McKee, the United States Indian agent for Northern California, broached this incident with Governor John Bigler in a letter, Bigler first whacked poetic about how the career of civilization under the auspices of the American people was interrupted by no dangers and daunted by no perils. He dismissed the massacres, claiming that according to representatives from the northern counties, Indians daily committed outrages upon unoffending citizens. He then lambasted McKee for impugning the intelligence and integrity of upstanding white men before proclaiming that he, as a private citizen and an elected official, would always take the side of patriots over savages. To that, McKee replied that he was entirely confident that investigation would result in showing the substantial accuracy of my information and the inaccuracy of theirs. He then remarked that, All experience shows that the accidental elevation of a man to a political station, especially in our frontier states, does not necessarily change his moral perceptions or sensibilities. In other words, elected officials could still be scoundrels. Then he reminded the governor that, your own experiences in California has doubtless led you to remark that if a pack train is attacked or robbed, if a corral in one of the valleys is broken into and robbed, the conclusion is instantly reached that the Indians are the aggressors. However, the cases are numerous in which, after Indians have been shot down like bullocks for supported crimes of this sort, it has been found to the satisfaction of all others concerned that white men were the real criminals. Indeed, white bandits often dressed up as Indians, and a white person was more likely to die from careless gunplay in a camp than at the hands of a California native. Still, the thousand extravagant statements made on this subject, in the public prints, and even by honorable members of the legislature, fueled genocidal fury. Even though most murders were white on white crimes, and livestock frequently went missing, in a long tradition of valuing property above the lives of racialized others, the Chico Weekly Quran insisted that, Nothing but extermination will keep them from committing their depredations. It is a false notion of humanity to save the lives of these red devils. There should be no prisoners taken, but a general sacrifice made of the whole race. Like the wild beast of prey, they are necessarily exterminated by the march of civilization. In one particularly brutal incident, a volunteer company invaded the island of the peaceful and unarmed Wiat people and hacked 188 of them to death with axes and knives. Most were women and children. The journalist who reported this massacre was chased out of town by a lynch mob. Settlers felt entitled to government aid in their campaigns against natives. After all, settler aggression was critical to the expansion and maintenance of the U.S. nation in the 19th century. More so than a professional military, volunteer militias, for which one out of every 12 Americans served, protected and extended the borders of the U.S. nation. The legitimacy of American government rested on recognizing the importance of settlers. So when settlers petitioned for aid from the state and federal government in their expeditions against natives, these governments obliged. By 1851, the California government provisioned volunteer militias with an arsenal containing 120 stands of arms and 90,000 cartridges. By 1852, nearly one-third of California's state debt was war debt, money borrowed to pay volunteer companies for hunting natives. Even though the California government was perpetually strapped for cash, legislators were willing to fund volunteer militias because they tacitly understood that the federal government would back them which it did with about a million dollars by 1856. The state also imposed a 50 cent tax on every non-serving white adult male to pay the militia. Everyone was expected to contribute to the genocide, either directly or financially, because in Jeffersonian logic, dispossessing natives was necessary for the perpetuation of a virtuous and sustainable republic, which relied upon private property and the willingness of white citizens to, in the words of a delegate to the California Constitutional Convention, aid in their defense to others. In 1852, federal agents negotiated the creation of eight reservations with California native tribes. Settlers balked. Representatives from the California Assembly deplored how the reservations would deprive white settlers of some of the most extensive tracts of desirable mineral and agricultural lands in California, only to make room for the introduction and settlement of a few tribes of ignorant barbarians. Ranchers and agriculturalists feared that extensive reservations would free supposedly docile mission Indians from the necessity of working for near starvation wages on white farms, vineyards, and ranches. Without mission Indian labor, it would, quote, be long before California can feed herself. 
As to the so-called wild Indians who fought to preserve their way of life, the Committee on Indian Reservations for the 1852 session of the California State Assembly referenced a long and bloody history of dispossession that included the extinction of Indian titles to 120 million acres of land in just the previous two decades alone to claim the undoubted right to remove all Indian tribes beyond the limits of the state. Of course, by 1852, there was no western region left where the government could move natives. Still, the only alternative, they insisted, was the extermination of Native Americans because, with its harbors, coastline, fertile lands, mineral wealth, and proximity to Asian markets, California was too important of a frontier state to not fully develop commercially. Thus, it was indispensable that California be wholly occupied by a homogenous population, all contributing by their character and occupation to its strength and independence. In the end, California representatives blocked the ratification of the reservation. Some federal and state agents deplored the rampant violence against natives, but ultimately, they accepted the rationale and inevitability of it. In 1851, the three federal agents sent to negotiate treaties with California natives wrote that there are two alternatives, extermination or domestication. Domestication means civilization and a cheap labor force. Domestication is the one which we deem the part of wisdom to adopt. In other words, even the most sympathetic and liberal federal officials felt the natives needed to surrender their lands to private industry and then become an exploitable labor force for capitalists, or else go away forever. Environmental decimation compelled many natives to bow to American authority. Numerous reports remark on how settlers annihilated game and polluted streams, which included perfusions of toxic mercury used to separate gold from gravel. Consequently, salmon runs diminished dramatically. Even the most sympathetic saw this as a tragically necessary development. As one federal agent wrote, the salmon and deer are both disappearing, owing, of course, to the improvement of the country by the white man. Settler capitalists could afford to despoil the environment because they imported food from world markets. California natives enjoyed no such luxury. It was their lands that were to be sacrifice zones, the places that capital must plunder to grow. In the face of capitalist enclosure, California natives did what racialized others have done for centuries. They adapted. Many became migrant or wage laborers. But white competition, jealousy, paranoia, and prejudice provoked vicious reprisals. If natives refused to work at subpar rates, they were called lazy and abused. When they worked for settlers, they risked torture from whites who tried to force them into exclusive service, such as what happened to a native boy who was tied to a horse and dragged until his arms were ripped from his soldiers when he resisted the demands of a man claiming ownership. When cattle went missing, whites indiscriminately slaughtered nearby natives, which often included the so-called docile ones, since whites moved near natives to exploit their labor. Some simply killed natives because they knew they would get away with it. Fundamentally, settlers genocided Native Americans because the presence of the Indian could not be reconciled with the contradictions of American democracy. The United States was supposed to be a land of opportunity, a land where a man born to poverty could secure a comfortable independence for his family. To many, Gold Rush California embodied the fulfillment of this American dream. Here, in the words of a delegate to the state constitutional convention, the golden age was before us in all its glittering splendor. Here, civilization would attain its highest altitude. Here, the Caucasian may attain his highest state of perfectibility. Yet almost from the outset, capitalist monopoly crowded out economic democracy. Very quickly, hydraulic mining, which required tens of thousands of dollars of capital, displaced the independent placer miner working streams with his pan. Very quickly, independent proprietorship gave way to wage labor, and incomes fell from $10 a day to $2 a day. Settlers understood, perhaps more than we do in our own time, the tendency of capitalists to create monopolies and to corrupt democracy. But settlers weren't just exploited proletariat made paranoid by economic precarity. They were invaders seeking to despoil the land and dispossess its current inhabitants in order to realize riches themselves. Race was their refuge from the ravages of capital, but whiteness served as the pretense for plunder for both settlers and capitalists, who both claimed to be carriers of civilization. For settlers, race was the immutable fact of their freedom, the one thing that couldn't be taken away, the one thing that entitled them to state support and social solidarity. Democracy was their dominion, inherent in them, and racialized others threatened diluting democracy as they willingly became pawns, peons, or coolies of capitalists. At the state constitutional convention, delegates proposed banning the immigration of free black persons on the grounds that the capitalists will fill the land with these living labor machines, with all their attendant evils. It will drive the poor and honest laborer from the field by degrading him to the level of the Negro. A few years later, the Senate discussed banning Chinese immigrants because this leprous labor could not be raised to white equality. But there was nowhere to expel the California natives who possessed prior claim to the land, the land that promised freedom and free wealth for settlers and commerce for capitalists. 
Thus, under the dictates of American democracy and capitalism, California natives could only be exterminated or enslaved. Slavery, massacres, and the devastation of ecosystems reduced the California native population from 150,000 in 1850 to 15,000 in 1900. 